about history and psychosomatic medicine, partially to emphasize that physicians always need histories to practice medicine, no matter how beguiling our laboratory studies are. But in another sense, we're all swimming in a sea of history, whether it's a personal one, like Fritz and Michael will be describing, or a vast social one, like the legacies of colonialism that Francis will be describing. In my case, it's a bit of both. I started my career at Stanford in the 1960s, deeply concerned about social forces, race riots, the Vietnam War, and the long shadow of the Holocaust. When I moved to Boston, I put those interests aside, or at least I thought I put them aside, to pursue a career in the laboratory as an experimentalist. I studied stress physiology in monkeys and people, and we found a way of unobtrusively drawing blood from people in the field. We called it then wet holter monitoring. I used that technique to study interns who were presenting cases at death and complications conferences. For many of them, it was their first public speaking opportunity as physicians, but the occasion was hardly celebratory. Instead, the interns had to explain to the chief of medicine what they had done wrong in caring for their patients. The extent of their catecholamine response was breathtaking. I used all the tools we had back then to characterize the sympathetic nervous system in all kinds of patient groups. It kept me occupied for decades. Meanwhile, I focused on my patients in the hospital as opposed to the surrounding community and society. Tom Hackett was my boss and he disapproved of focusing on broad societal issues. We were to take care of the hospital and our patients. But history kept happening all around me. Many of my patients were scarred by their personal encounters with history victims of individual violence like assault or rape, and victims of large-scale societal violence like racism or the Holocaust. In the laboratory, we were using the old Dynamap blood pressure monitor to record BP while our subjects performed various tasks like mental arithmetic. Typically, blood pressure might increase 10 or 20 millimeters mercury with such tasks. Once I was talking with one of my volunteers after he had completed the protocol and I had forgotten to turn off the monitor. He was a Harvard undergrad who confided his worries about getting into medical school. We chatted about this. It was clearly an important topic for him, but he wasn't visibly upset. When he left, I glanced at the blood pressure monitor printout and was shocked to find that his systolic blood pressure had increased <clears throat> to 170 millimeters mercury. I thought it was a defect in the monitor. Then I started my work on stress and blood pressure in blacks and whites. Here, I intentionally recorded blood pressure while asking my subjects what it was like to grow up black or white in America. All of a sudden, the weight of history became evident. It was not uncommon for my black volunteers to demonstrate systolic blood pressures in excess of 180. My office at that time was in a little garret room on the top floor of this isolated building on the MGH grounds. One day there was a knock on my door and when I opened it, I found a man 
carrying a gun case. He asked me, are you Dimsdale? I said, yes. Whereupon he pushed his way in, sat down on my couch and told me, I am the executioner and I have come for you. While he was opening his case, I wondered who I had pissed off so much to want to kill me. When the case opened, it revealed not a gun, but documents from Germany. He had been the executioner at Nuremberg, and he had come to tell me that I needed to study the Nazi leaders. I was shaken by this interaction, but how could I study the past anyway? I shelved it. Eventually, I moved to San Diego, ran a consultation psychiatry service, ran a laboratory studying stress and sleep, and got heavily involved in science administration with government agencies, foundations, and journals. I also got deeply involved in university politics throughout the University of California system. My wife tells me that one year I was out of town 100 days in all these various activities. It was fun. It was challenging. It was exhausting. My mantra in all those settings was that the past is important for us to understand the present and to plan the future. When it came time to retire, I had to think, what would I do with myself? Was retirement like walking the plank or was it a bridge to something or somewhere else? I crossed that bridge and returned to my first love, history, and I discovered that archives are filled with treasures. Anatomy of, Anatomy of Malice answered the executioner's challenge to me so long ago. That book focused on the history of the psychiatric examination of the Nuremberg war criminals. I wanted to understand how state leaders could orchestrate malice on a genocidal level. Subsequently, I started wondering how a population could be persuaded to follow such a path. Were they inherently murderous? Were they hoodwinked by propaganda? Were they brainwashed? And what on earth did that term even mean? Where did it come from? Even despite my intellectual interest in the topic, I would probably never have written a book about the history of brainwashing if not for my neighbors who were members of the Heaven's Gate commune. A few miles away from us, they had themselves castrated and then committed a mass suicide so they could teleport to the stars. It's one thing when there's a suicidal cult half a world away, but when it's your neighbors, it grabs your attention. And so I began my work on dark persuasion. When I tell people I'm interested in brainwashing, the typical response is, oh, brainwashing, isn't that musty old Cold War, you know, bad science and evil scientists? That's really not accurate at all. Brainwashing extended throughout the 20th century and is ongoing. There were some bad scientists, but also some Nobel laureates. There were saints and sinners, rogues and opportunists. The history of these individuals and the social factors that they were caught up in gave birth to brainwashing. I learned that many of our predecessors in consultation psychiatry and our universities had been involved in such work. I'll highlight a few of them, some creditable and some shameful. I was working in the UCLA archives, poring over the uh, documents and papers of Jolly West. During the Korean War, West had been an Air Force psychiatrist 
studying the returning American POWs. You may not recall this, but the savagery of their experience has been unparalleled. The POW death rate in Korea was higher than that observed even under the Japanese in World War II or in Vietnam. Under these some circumstances, many of the POWs began to collaborate with their captors. And Dr. West obtained data on this. Not only did the Chinese get American POWs to confess to war crimes and make anti-war propaganda broadcasts, but they seemed to improve their technique over time. In the course of a year and a half, the percent of prisoners caving in to pressure increased from 25% to 75%. The word brainwashing, a matter of fact, first appeared during the Korean War. Thereafter, the United States was obsessed with the problem and created, in essence, a giant Manhattan project of the mind to study ways of persuading the enemy. As Dulles warned, the Russians take human beings whom they wish to destroy and turn them into humble confessors of crimes they never committed. New techniques wash the brain clean of the thoughts. Indirect CIA funding flowed to universities, researchers through front foundations and research institutes. Cornell New York Hospital was ground zero for much of this surreptitious funding. Harold Wolf and Larry Hinkle at Cornell received funds and channeled money through the society for the investigation of human ecology. This CIA funding supported scores of university laboratories across the country. Wolf at that time was America's leading neurologist and Hinkle was a brilliant internist who studied stress and heart disease. Both were leaders in psychosomatic medicine. Wolf worked closely with the CIA on various mission driven projects that raised profound ethical considerations. The documents at Cornell are abundant here we see how Wolf answered a delicate question posed by CIA agent White. What is the possibility of working out a graph indicating the state of panic of the enemy based upon the varying degree of pressure used? Wolf replied smoothly, yours is a very provocative notion and I'm sure it could be documented. Warm regards. Wolf's proposal to the CIA started off somewhat ominously. It sounded like a dire experiment on rodents, but perhaps it might be justifiable if precautions were taken in terms of pain, etc. He wrote, Potentially useful secret drugs and brain damaging procedures will be tested in order to ascertain their fundamental effect upon brain function. Then the proposal veered into a shocking direction. It becomes clear that he wanted to conduct these studies on people. Not only that, he wanted the CIA to furnish the victims and then dispose of them. MKUltra devoted enormous effects at studying LSD, determining its dose, if there was habituation with continued use, if there was an antidote, could it be used to immobilize an enemy? Psychiatry was fascinated by LSD that such a small amount of drug could lead to such enormous behavioral effects. The field wondered if LSD research could help us understand schizophrenia. 
Chet Pierce and Jolly West infamously, infamously dosed an elephant named Tusco at the Oklahoma City Zoo in an effort to understand how LSD affected aggressive behavior. They dreadfully miscalculated the dose and gave him almost 12,000 times the human dose. Writing in his unpublished diary, Jolly West says, just shot him with the LSD. He whirled around to face the source of attack. He's very aggressive, very restless, and running around trying to shake the syringe out. Judy, his companion elephant, seems to be making an effort to comfort him. She has brought some food over and put it down near him in a way that she knows from past experience would interest him. Tusco then goes into respiratory arrest and dies. West and Pierce write this up in an article in Science, concluding that elephants can be said to possess an enormous sensitivity of their central nervous system to LSD. The government studies frequently involved unwitting individuals surreptitiously dosed, and there were casualties. Perhaps the most notorious experiment involved Frank Olson, a government scientist who was surreptitiously dosed with LSD dropped into his Cointreau. Subsequently, subsequently, he became depressed and agitated for days until his death ensued. This family photo shows him as a father in happier times. The CIA took him to see Dr. Abramson, an expert who had ties with the Institute. Abraham Abramson was also in the vanguard of early psychosomatic investigators. This was a VIP patient and we CL docs know the problems that come from treating VIPs. Rather than immediately hospitalize the patient, Abramson sent him back to the Statler Hotel with two CIA minders. Olson died that night after falling out of his hotel window. It's not clear if it was an accident, if he jumped, and some people feel he was pushed by his CIA guards. The family was never told about the secret LSD dosing as a contributor to his mental state, and the CIA covered this up for decades. My final vignette comes from Montreal. Perhaps some of you are familiar with Robert Ludlum's Jason Bourne books and movies. Recall the plot, a young soldier played by Matt Damon, goes to see an avuncular psychiatrist who agrees to radically restructure the young man's life. The doctor destroys the man's memories and trains him to become a consummate assassin. It's a compelling story that is partially based on one of the most notorious CIA-sponsored brainwashing studies. In essence, it's all true except for the assassin business. The CIA had supported the eminent psychologist Donald Hebb on his studies of the effects of sensory isolation. Hebb observed that when people were isolated from their environment, they didn't think clearly and became highly suggestible. There were unusual ramifications from his findings. The military supported research on polio patients in iron lungs. Many of these patients were inexplicably agitated and delirious, and researchers thought that some of the delirium was triggered by their sensory isolation. We are, of course, familiar with the clinical implications of this sensory isolation in ICU settings today but most do not know the scientific lineage of this knowledge. Hebb's work provided an intellectual rationale for enrichment programs like Project Head Start. 
Hebb thought that if we could enrich children's early environment, they might have a better emotional and intellectual development. The darker side of Hebb's work was that the government noted that after sensory isolation, people became confused and more suggestible. Meanwhile, across town, psychiatrist Ewan Cameron headed up the Allen Institute of Psychiatry. Cameron believed that psychotherapy could be speeded up if you simply obliterated old memories, isolated his patients from their family and environment, and then started anew. With support from Cornell's CIA-sponsored institute, he obliterated memory with massive doses of ECT, high doses of LSD, and other drugs. After weeks of this, he played tape loops up to a quarter million times while his patients slept. The, patients in, the, the loops instructed patients on how they should feel and behave. A woman admitted for postpartum depression had to listen to this tape. Do you realize that you're a very hostile person? Do you know you're hostile with the nurses? Do you know you're hostile with the patients? Why do you think you're so hostile? Did you hate your mother? Did you hate your father? A quarter of a million times the tape played. Cameron succeeded in destroying memories, but could not show that his patients learned much from the tape repetitions. The lawsuits are still being adjudicated. Cameron, by the way, was president of the American Psychiatric Association. So you see, we have the leading psychologists, psychiatrists, and neurologists engaged in brainwashing research. In my book, I focused on brainwashing in the 20th century. While it was tempting to talk about current events and controversies, I think we need more distance in time to have a dispassionate perspective. However, I do have some thoughts on things that might develop in the future. The first challenge will be neuroscience. We were able to do some surprising things in the 1960s. James Olds stimulated pleasure and pain circuits and was able to shape rodent behavior accordingly. Rodents learned to run their mazes much faster if they were reinforced by direct brain stimulation as opposed to kibble. Robert Heath pioneered in brain, deep brain stimulation in people, studying how implanted electrodes could modify complex behavior. The CIA famously approached him and asked would he work with them on pleasure and pain circuits, but he spurned their invitation stating, I'm a doctor, not a spy. We can do much more today with safer and more precise surgery or magnetic stimulation. We are restrained by a sense of professional ethics and today's work on deep brain stimulation focuses on clinical conditions. Would that restraint be evident in times of war? I think the bigger challenge will come from social media. It offers so much promise, but there is a dark side. We need to ask ourselves if social media can be weaponized as a tool for coercive persuasion. If social media is associated with bullying, coercion, surreptitious monitoring, and restricted information, we wonder if it becomes a tool for coercive persuasion. Furthermore, if it is addictive and associated with sleep restriction, it is even more worrisome. In this sense, social media is just another social intoxicant. And as we know from examples of drinking and driving, it takes decades for cultures to develop expectations and regulations for how one interacts 
with new intoxicants. Tomorrow's brainwashers could not help exploring the possibilities of social media, a tool for people and carrying messages. Plato cautioned that storytellers rule the world. Tomorrow's citizens will need to evaluate the storytellers' tales on social media with great care. And so I'll end my remarks. As Lou has indicated, the purpose of this symposium was to call back from the ice flow some of the Hackett awardees and to learn what we've been up to. In my case, I continue my musings about social forces and the imprint of history on psychiatry. I shared with you the surprising involvement of the leaders of our field 60 years ago as a cautionary tale. Remember that your work will also be seen through the lens of history and that ethical considerations are always in front of us. Thank you, and I'll turn this back to Luke.